Okay, so I'll talk for um, 15 minutes or so about the um, status of tax policy in Australia. The impact, I think, that the unstable government, and, and it has been unstable government, it's not just this recent election, it's been, you know, the past couple of elections as well, things have been pretty unsteady in the political landscape in Australia. And so I'll talk about the, the impact of that on, on what's dear to our heart, which is, which is more um, tax policy. And then after that, we'll have I'll call Grant back to the, the front of the room and we'll um, have a crack at answering any questions that you might have. The government of the day, whoever that might be, they do love to meddle with tax policy, which is probably fair enough uh, because the, they are there to raise taxes and then to spend that money for the greater good. But the, the constant tinkering that we see with the tax system and um, I'll, no, I'll um, bring that back to superannuation, which is the, the part of tax that, that I know and love. Uh, but that constant tinkering does cause confusion, it does reduce confidence in the system, uh, and it, it does make things very uncertain for people. The, um, and, and I know that I shouldn't stand here and <coughs> whinge about that, because the, the politicians have made it so bloody complicated that they've really given us a job for life. Yeah, we have unlimited amounts of um, consulting work that we can do. Uh, but it does get very difficult for people like us as advisors when we do have announcements on the 3rd of May in a budget, then we have an election to go through, and then a month after the election we still don't have any clarity on what the changes are, are actually going to end up being. So that uh, May 3 budget will be my prime example number one. And it's interesting because the, the Liberal Party, they do seem to be in, in, general, um, in genuine shock at the backlash that's been generated by their, their budget announcements on specifically on, or particularly on superannuation. They, um, there seems to be all sorts of scurrying around at the moment, you know, talking about oh, will, they, will they carve this out or will they carve that out or whatever. And, that, and as I said, there's still not much clarity on, on where they're going with all of that. The announcements that they made have been predicated on their belief that superannuation is a system to um, assist people in generating wealth for them to use to provide an income for them in their retirement. Their belief is that it's not there to be, provide a, a tax effective um, system within which to build wealth to then pass on to the next generation. So superannuation, they see as being there to use um, for, for retirement, and, and I, would, I would certainly uh, broadly agree with that. So I'll, I'll briefly run through the, um, the changes that have been announced, but certainly not enacted at this stage. And the first of those is the mystery of the ever-shrinking concessional contribution limits. If you look back at where it was in 2006 on this left-hand side of the slide, $100,000 per year, um, that then halved in about 2010 financial year to $50,000. It then halved again uh, with Labor in power at the time at, uh, to $25,000 for 2013. Then bounced back up to 35s. And for the current year, it's important to note that for the current financial year it is still $35,000. But the announcement is that from next financial year, so from 1 July 2017, that it would be at $25,000. So for the 2018 financial year. And when the budget came out, I, I read through and I thought, oh, that, that's obviously a, um, uh, yeah, no, it, it's, it, it's obviously a mistake that they, they want to go to get it down to $25,000. Because a lot of people, just with their salary, their 9.5% SGC contributions, can get pretty, pretty close to that, if not, if not over that, if there wasn't a cap on those SGC contributions. So um, that, that's the, the first of the changes that they've announced uh, in the budget to reduce, to minimise, to cut back that, um, that access that people have to the tax concessions that are available through superannuation. And I should point out that when I say concessional contributions, you might also think of those being tax deductible contributions. So contributions for which you can get a tax deduction. Secondly, uh, they thought, well, why don't we also reduce the amount that people can put in to superannuation by way of non-concessional contributions? Now, non-concessional contributions are where you don't get a tax deduction. So this is where you, you've got your own wealth outside of superannuation that's invested wherever. You've already paid tax on it to generate that wealth. 
and you've decided that, okay, you're prepared to put that into the government regulated superannuation system, abide by the rules and regulations of that system, abide by the <coughs> investment restrictions, the um, accessibility and preservation restrictions, you'll put that wealth into superannuation so that then that money can then be invested in the super system and you will save tax then on future earnings on that wealth. And that's traditionally been a, an annual limit. Now, you might remember way back before May 2006, uh, there was no limit for non-concessional or undeducted contributions. You could put as much as you wanted into the superannuation system. And then, just prior to, um, well, in the May 2006 budget, so leading up to the 2007 financial year, um, Howard and Costello famously said, no, we're going to restrict how much you can put into super, but we'll give you a one-off one opportunity to put a million dollars into superannuation before June 2007. And so people were scurrying around and getting their shackles together and, and putting money into uh, superannuation as non concessional contributions before the, the annual limit of $150,000 then come in. And so it's been that way for eight or nine years now. Uh, got indexed up to $180,000 last year. And then it's $180,000 uh, up until the budget this year, May 2016. And then the, um, the think tank at, in the Liberal Party thought, well, actually, why don't we make it a, a, a lifetime limit? Why don't we make it $500,000 uh, for life? So not have an annual limit anymore, but make it for life. And then they thought, well, and actually, wouldn't it be a fantastic idea if we, if we then made a lifetime limit, but why don't we apply that lifetime limit <coughs> back in 1 July 2007 for 2008 financial year? So we'll go all the way back to 1 July 2007, and this is, this is where I was reading the, uh, the, uh, well, the analysis on, on the night, and I thought, that be, yeah, well, surely that's a typo. Yeah, surely it's, it's 1 July 2007, so if I, I can see that, yeah, a $500,000 limit from 1 July 2017 going forward. But then I kept reading technical updates the next day. I'm, get all these technical updates and come, come by my computer screen. And they all had the same typo in them. <laughs> <laughs> and it was 2007, and I was, I was gobsmacked. Uh, and the government very carefully explained to us that it's not retrospective. It looks and feels retrospective to me. I, mean, I might not be a wordsmith, but um, it feels retrospective. So that was the, the second way that the government's announcements uh, reduced the accessibility of, of, of getting money into superannuation. Thirdly, they thought, well, actually, we, we haven't heard of reasonable benefit limits for a long time. But back in the olden days, there was, you could put unlimited amounts into superannuation, as I said, but there was a um, tax effective amount, and that was referred to as reasonable benefit limit. And back in the day, back in 2007, that was about 1.3, 1.4 million dollars for a pension benefit. And so the Liberal Party have come with, oh, well, yeah, 1.6 million has got a nice ring to it. And so they've, they've said, um, okay, from 1 July 2017, so this is the 2018 financial year, uh, we'll make it uh, 1.6 million dollars that you can pull out in terms of your pension paying superannuation account. Now that's important because that, the pension paying superannuation account pays no tax, it's got a nil tax rate. And so they've said, and if you've got more than $1.6 million in a pension account, well, what we'll say to you that in a year's time when, when this comes to pass, um, we, the, the excess that you've got over the $1.6 million, you either take that out of super or you leave it within super but within an accumulation account paying 15% tax. Okay? And, and most people aren't too bad on that. They like, you know, can live with, you know, certainly paying some tax on their, on their superannuation. But that was the third, um, the third way that they've smacked uh, superannuation, and it kind of goes against world's best practice, I believe, with retirement systems. And um, world's best practice is that if you have a retirement planning system, that firstly, you try and keep the money in there, and that secondly, when people take money out, you encourage them or even force them to take the money out as a pension. Now this is almost saying, 
any ad one point six, don't take it out of the pension, just take it out of the lump sum if that's what you want to do. Um, and certainly they're not um, looking to necessarily keep and get money into into that system. And uh, with, with all due respect, Grant, energy might explain everything, but I'm not sure energy explains that. <laughs> <laughs> you, you might be able to find a way where it does, but I'm, I'm just not sure what that is. And this, this led me to having some initial thoughts on the, the budget. Um, I thought, you know, that these announcements were a little bit, um, were definitely unexpected by the general um, community. Uh, in the past, <coughs> changes that we've seen, the tinkering that we've seen, the superannuation, it's always been grandfathered, the change. In the past, they've been very carefully not retrospective. Uh, I thought, with that $1.6 million limit, is, is there to be a family limit? Okay, so you have a husband and wife, um, they've got $1.6 million in super each, <coughs> they can each, so effectively their family limit is $3.2 million that they can have in tax-free superannuation arrangements uh, under this, the new proposals. But then what about, what about the family where there's a differentiation in the earnings of the spouses? So you might have a very high income earner, uh, they've got $3.2 million in superannuation. You might have a, um, their spouse might be a, a low, have low income, might be a, a, a stay-at-home parent perhaps, but they might have next to nothing in superannuation. That family is going to pay a lot more superannuation tax than the family that's got the two lots of $1.6 million in superannuation. And so is the government going to recognise that and then apply some sort of family Limit where you can split the, the, the larger balance, split the larger balance between the two spouses. Uh, there is a way of doing it at the moment. That's called divorce, and that's not <laughs> part of our that's not part of our tax uh, plan. But but I think that's the sort of question the government's got to start answering uh, because as I say, we're a month after the election and we still haven't got any uh, any clarity around around that sort of issue. Uh, similarly, what happens upon death of a spouse? You know, you've got a spouse, you've got two spouses. Uh, one's got a $1.6 million pension that they're drawing from superannuation. The other spouse is now deceased. Their $1.6 million benefit under the current system could be taken back out of superannuation by the surviving spouse as a, as a pension, as a tax-free pension. Under the new system, because they've already got that $1.6 million pension, are they going to be required to take the balance out as a lump sum and take it out of super and then the grieving widow or whatever then has to think about, okay, well, what do I do with this money that's now out of the, the superannuation system? And this is where I'm saying, well, I think world's best practice is to actually leave the money in the system where the regulations are good, the investment strategies are good, the system is good, and people know what to do with their money. So another, I think, something that needs to be answered, but, and there's all these talk about carve-outs for an inheritance and carve-outs for this and, and that and so forth, but I haven't actually heard any discussion yet on, on these sorts of issues. And we've certainly pinging these issues off to the government um, before prior to the election. And finally, um, the, the thing that um, struck me is, and, and, and this is a little bit unusual for me, but I, I did feel sorry for the tax office. I thought, who's going to have to administer this and keep track of that back to 2000, and one's like 2007, who's going to have to keep track of all of these non-concessional contributions that have been made over that past eight years or so? And the tax office, is the, um, the holder of, of all that, not they are the source of truth on, on that. And so how are they going to manage um, keeping track of that? And so to test them out a little bit, we, uh, we rang the tax office a couple of uh, days after the budget and um, with, with the client scenario, and they gave us the detail of the contributions this client had made over the last eight years, and it took about 40 minutes for the phone call, uh, they, or the tax, to their credit, the tax office almost got it right, but there was we did know this client situation pretty well, and they did get a there was an error in what came through to us, and they refused to give it to us in writing, and we said, well, that's not acceptable. We you know, could not have it in, in writing from the tax office, um, and we made a couple of comments about that in the press um, soon soon thereafter, and next thing you know, we've got a phone call from the tax office um, asking about well, what are you, um, you know, what are the issues that you struck and what do you see as the, the, you know, what, what are the important factors for you? 
And it was, it was all very cordial, I must say, because you know, our firm has a, a fabulous reputation with the tax office, and it's something that we you know, were very, very careful about maintaining. Mm -hmm. um, but they did say that they're working on getting it, um, uh, getting it to advisors in, in writing, and that was the, the main point. It was the thing that we, we really needed to have. Mm -hmm. I was gobsmacked when, on the 14th of June, I received a letter from the tax office, and they listed for us. Um, and I'm sure you can't see this, and I actually don't want you to see this because it's confidential information, but they listed, down, <laughs> they listed down every one of our clients. They listed down, they listed across the line the contribution, the non-concessional contributions that each of our clients has made over the past eight years, and the total of the contributions that they've made for that, for that period. And I just thought, wow, yeah, that is incredible. The algorithms that the tax office would have to have in place to mine all of that data, the uh, computer power that they would have to have in place to do this is incredible. Because you've got to understand, they've, they've got to get these contributions from all of the funds that our clients have contributed to. They, and each client, yeah, a client might have three or four superannuation arrangements. They've then got to um, cross-reference that back to the individual's tax return to make sure that the individual hasn't claimed that as a tax deduction in their personal tax, so it's not a non-concessional contribution, it becomes a concessional contribution. And I just thought that was incredible. Um, my next thought was, gee, um, Big Brother is watching. <laughs> you know, if, if the tax office can mine their data that effectively, that quickly, and change this, because I'm sure they had no forewarning about the, um, the budget changes that were being announced. So I would pay each of you to be very careful with the information that you lodge with the tax office because they, they really are, and we have heard this before, haven't we, Neil, that we, they really are um, uh, generating a lot of capability uh, with their computer systems and their, their data mining systems. So what do we do um, as advisors? Uh, what do we tell people to do? It's all still very uncertain. Um, as I say, there's a lot of nervous wriggling going on at the moment with uh, potential changes and non-potential changes and whatever. But the overarching point that I make to people is that superannuation is still the best place for a chunk of your retirement savings to be. It is still very tax effective and so to the extent that it's available to you, you really should be maximising superannuation contributions if it makes sense to do so. Like if you're, if you're a 40 year old, you may not want to put money into extra money into super because you can't touch it for 25 years. But if you're closer to age 60, closer to age 65, yeah, yeah put what you can into super because it's been becoming very limited, you know, the amounts that you can put in there. Um, we, we have a lot of clients that have a lot of money in super and, and I think good luck to them, you know, fantastic. They've, they've played by the rules over all those years. They've gone to the effort and the expense uh, to get all that money into superannuation and it will still be the right place for it to be. Okay, part of it will now be paying 15% tax on earnings, which wasn't, which it may not have been before, but it's still a great place for your money to be. Super's essentially a use or lose it system, so if you don't use your contribution limits in a year, um, generally speaking, you, you lose the opportunity to put that money into super. There is some smoothing and so forth being proposed uh, which may help that a bit, but um, essentially you need to be aware of how much you can put in each year. You need to be engaged with your superannuation, engaged with your general wealth management affairs to make sure that you're doing the right thing prior to that 30 June rolling around to maximise your position with your, your own wealth management and have a plan in place as to how you're going to go about it. And remember that it is still $35,000 for this financial year, not the $25,000 that's been widely sprouted. What to do in the future? Um, the, main, the main thing with the future is to build in flexibility so that you're not hamstrung by changes to this part of superannuation, or you're not hamstrung by changes to what an individual's allowed to invest in, or by what a family trust is allowed to invest in. Work. Do it all. Um, we're, we're very much in favour of um, having family trust as part of the arrangement in the middle there. As I said, first and foremost, put what you can 
and what makes sense into superannuation. But then to the extent you've got extra money, um, think about personal portfolios, personal investment portfolios can be very effective for people. Uh, you can earn a lot of money in your own name, a lot of investment income in your own name and not pay very much tax, depending on what other income you might have. And then family trusts can be fantastic as well. They, um, the, way, the way I'd like to put it is they, they tick a lot of boxes, and I'll put the boxes up here right now, but some of, some of the boxes that they tick is that although, although superannuation is very tax efficient, superannuation is a, a taxed entity in its own right and it's taxed at a very low rate, family trusts are very tax effective still. They're what we refer to as tax neutral. The income earned by the family trust then flows down to the beneficiaries. And so if there are low tax paying <coughs> beneficiaries, then you can pay very little tax on the income that you earn through a family trust. They tick a lot of other boxes as well. They're, the super, super funds are very good for asset protection, but so are family trusts. And in addition, with a family trust, there's no <coughs> investment restrictions. You can own your holiday house, you can own your artworks, your grand Germany's collections, you know, whatever. In, um, uh, in your family trust, you can't own those things in your superannuation fund. So no investment restrictions. The money in a family trust is not locked away, it's not preserved, it's not subject to retirement after age 60 and reaching age 65 and, and all of that sort of thing. It's accessible to you. A big, um, a big point here is that a family trust continues upon death. Now, what I mean there is that if you wish, if it makes sense for your family situation, you can pass on the family trust intact to the with investment portfolios and assets, holiday houses and whatever intact to the next generation. You don't have to wind it up. The superannuation fund, once you die, um, you have to wind up your account in your superannuation fund. Super funds do not continue on after death. Uh, family trusts certainly can. Um, they can be great for philanthropy, for making donations and so forth. Obviously you wouldn't make, in fact, can't make donations out of your superannuation fund. You can take money out of your fund and then make the donation, but uh, um, trusts are ideal for, um, for donation. And not to forget that having personal investments tick a lot of boxes as well, particularly once your salary and wages income ceases, and so you've got your tax-free thresholds and things. You, know, you can earn eighteen thousand dollars and not pay any tax. Um, you can earn twenty nine thousand dollars and not pay any tax if you're over a certain age. Uh, so, so personally, we, we certainly wouldn't forget about personal investment portfolios as well. Uh, and, and one one thought that I would leave you with is that it's very important then to if you've got a, a investment structure like this, it's it's um, it's highly flexible. Um, it's, it's highly tax efficient, um, you can deal with whatever the government throws at you in terms of regulations, but make sure that encompassing all of this structure you have your estate planning well and truly in place as well. Uh, it's really important that when you build up good quality wealth, good level of wealth, it's really important that your assets pass to who you want them to pass to. Uh, it's important that your assets pass in a tax efficient manner and also that your assets pass in a, you know, perhaps in an asset protected manner as well. And this is a real big focus of ours, uh, talking to people about what they're doing with their estate planning, making sure that they're sorted out uh, so that the, the best situation continues on, not just for yourselves, but then for the next generation as well. Uh, and I think with that, Neil, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. And uh, so thank you very much for your attention. And I'll ask Neil to step back and we can have some questions if you wish.